Welcome to About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can make long success. Now, here to help you ask all the right is the winning author, international speaker, and business strategist. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome. welcome to the show. As always, excited to be with you all today, and I especially love it when I get to interview people that want to be back on my show and like after their first interview with me, they go, can I be back on after I write my next book? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I get reached out when their next book comes out and I read their next book and I hate them because it keeps me up all night long. I like can't put the dang book down because and like everything else I had planned to do is out the window because I, I just I have to keep reading because I have to know what happens. And, you know, your arms get tired because you're holding the book up because it's a real book, not not a Kindle book, because I like to have the physical books in my hand. And, and you just keep reading and reading and reading to the forget everything else that's happening in the world. You just have to know what's going on in the book. And so I'm excited to have Brad Taylor back on the show with me today. So everybody, woohoo, Brad's back on. He's the author of the New York <laughs> Times. <laughs> I know, right, Brad? Doesn't it get exciting when you know that the person who's interviewing is a huge fan? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so, I mean, you've written so many New York Times bestselling books. The Pike Logan series, which I just love, love, love. And this new book, oh my God, I can't wait for the next one because I, I just have to know what comes next. But, you know, you... Number one, thank you for the serv- your service, right? More than 20 years in the U.S. Army, eight years Special Forces, uh, Delta Force, and then you served, um, you retired as a lieutenant colonel. You live in South Carolina, now in Charleston. Which, did you guys get hit by uh, Hurricane Florence in Charleston? We didn't. We didn't. We uh, packed up everything, bundled everything up, and uh, evacuated. I was actually on a security contract at the time. My wife had to pack you know, the kids and the dogs up. And left, and then the hurricane took a huge left turn and completely missed us. We had maybe a couple of pine towns. That was about it. Because I interviewed lucky. Nicholas Sparks when he came to town, and they did a, um, they had to, they had a, the Performing Arts Center, and there were about a thousand people for his new book release. So they asked me to interview him on stage, and we were talking because where he's from in North Carolina, in, in New Bern, really got devastated badly. So. Thankfully, you guys yeah. were okay in, in South Carolina. Yeah, I really. moved up to Wilmington and all that. That's where yeah. I did. Yeah. So you are a very prolific writer of books, which is something that a lot of my listeners wish they were. And I don't know how you do it, because so many people who are as prolific as you, their books seem very formulaic. After a while, it's just like, oh, yeah, this is going to happen. Okay, we're going to have that happen. Oh, yeah, that's going to happen. But I don't feel that in your books. How do you manage to stay so fresh? Uh, honestly, don't know. When I was writing two books a year, I look back on that time. I'm back down to one book a year. Um, I was doing two books a year plus two short stories, which were actually novellas. Um, and uh, most of the time, it's just something in the news that spikes my interest. And I start doing the research on it and... and Truth is always stranger than fiction. You can always dig through uh, some new story somewhere and come up with a fascinating story to tell. This book is, and I'm not going to spoil this book for anybody who hasn't read it yet. Besides, today is launch day, by the way. Congratulations. You are already an Amazon Thank bestselling you. author. Well, thank you. I, I always check that out when I get to do launch day with an author. So it is Tuesday, January 8th, launch day of your book. And it's only 11 a.m. Eastern, and you are already in the Amazon bestsellers. <laughs> didn't take right. you very long, so I expect New York well, Times will thank come Thank you. I, I didn't even know that. I was because I'm out here in Phoenix, so it's <laughs> early for me. It's early for you. And, and do you check your ratings and your rankings all the time, or you just try to stay away from that? No, I mean, I'll check them occasionally. I don't actually don't really check the ratings so much as I do reviews just to see what people are saying. Okay. Um, but I don't, I don't obsess over it. I'll, you know, I'll check every three days or so and see if somebody said something about, you know, one of the short stories or new book or something like that. But I don't, I don't really obsess over it. All right. Well, I'll have to get your review up within the next day or so of this book because um, I really enjoyed it and I have to get your review up on it because there's no reviews yet. But since the book just went live today, it takes a couple of days before people can get their reviews up on it. Um, all right. So. When I was reading this book, and I said, I don't want to give any spoilers, but you talk about Syria in here, you talk about North Korea in here, 
And for me, I feel like those are some places we should really be seriously thinking about in the world today with everything going on. And you, how long ago did you start writing this book? Uh, this was, we were just starting to, well, I have to go back and look at my notes. I, technically, I should have been writing it in um, uh, somewhere last summer, but that never happens. I ended up having my knee replaced, and I ended up going uh, overseas, and all these other things happened. So I probably started writing it around November-ish. Okay. All right. So things were starting to percolate with Kim Jong-un and, and North Korea, but I don't think you're making up most of the stuff in this book, or are you? And I, I know you're that good a writer, but how do we determine what's truth from fiction with what we read in your book? Because I personally think more of it's truth. Well, a lot of it is true. Exactly right. In fact, the, the gem of the story itself came from we were rattling sabers against uh, Kim Jong Un, you know, fire and fury and all that for his nuclear weapons program. And when I was assigned special forces on Okinawa, our wartime mission was the Korean Peninsula. It's a, the balloon went up and we went to war. That's what we were supposed to do. Uh, so I had a pretty good understanding of uh, the offensive capability of the North Korean Army. And they have five tons of chemical and biological weapons. They have enough artillery, chemical and biological weapons to just turn South Korea into a slag heap of chemical mess. And I, it kind of struck me as odd that we go crazy over the nuclear threat, which we should, don't get me wrong. That's definitely something we don't want. But we don't seem to care about the chemical biological threat. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if Kim Jong-un, to get around our sanctions against his nuclear threat, sold chemical and biological weapons for money? Uh, because they're easier to transport, they're easier to use. He just killed his half-brother two years ago, and that's in the book, and it's true. He killed him in Malaysia using nerve agent. Um, and it's easier to manufacture if he sold that the components to that, uh, why, why don't we care about that? And so that kind of sparked the story. Okay, so let me ask you that question, because you, you have the credentials to answer it. Why don't we care about that? <laughs> I think it's because in, in the world, it, 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 that cat's out of the bag and they have it, and uh, so there's, there's nothing we can do about it. And so we do care as far as the offensive capability for defending the South Korean Peninsula. Believe me, we definitely cared about it. We were looking at the range fans and everything else. But... Uh, as far as selling it to somebody else, he hasn't done it yet, and it's kind of the cat's out of the bag. Uh, he's got it. So I think it's more along the lines of let's stop him from getting nuclear because he doesn't have it yet, but there's nothing we can do about the chemical and biological. The, yet the average person, me, okay, I'm just thinking this through. I'm, I'm thinking that we've got this situation. We know somebody's got it, and we have know other people um, – in other countries, Syria is using them. We've seen them use them on their people. We know they've gotten, there's got to be something we can do, right? Nuclear seems like the bigger threat, but to me, the the other is seems worse. Or are we just not knowing? Are they not telling us that they're trying to do something about it? No, we have a huge counterproliferation program in the United States. That uh, There's a ton of organizations that are constantly tracking that stuff. Um, so it's not that it's just not promoted on the news as much, but make no mistake, the um, Department of Defense Intelligence Agencies are certainly tracking that. Okay, well that that's comforting at a level from from my perspective. You know, I don't often get to speak to somebody like you, who and my listeners don't often get to hear a perspective. You know, you write these amazing books. Your latest book is. Um, Daughter of War, another Pike Logan thriller. And it's to me, it was really not like some of the other ones. It, it had a different feel. And, but talking, to, my listeners get to hear a different perspective of how you get to weave real world into a book, yet somehow skirt a line of, in your case, I mean, you have access to a lot of confidential information, top secret information that you really can't talk about from your experiences as a Delta Force member, from some of the security work that you're doing now, it, to me it would seem like it could be very difficult to walk that line. And I know a lot of my listeners write books and there are certain situations that aren't as mission critical, so to speak, that they want to put in there and they don't know how to walk that line. So perhaps when we come back from our commercial break, you'd be willing to share how you decide what you could 
put in and and what you can't put in to your books. Would you be willing to talk about that? Sure. Okay. Hang on, and we'll be right back after our first commercial break. Welcome back, everybody. We are here with Brad Taylor, author of Daughter, excuse me, Daughter of War, another Pike Logan thriller. He's going to be at the Vero Beach Book Center this Saturday, January 12th at 3 p.m. And you get to meet him live and he'll be signing books and his books will be for sale as well. And I highly recommend you get it because I could not put his latest book down. So Brad Taylor's latest book is Daughter of War and he'll be at the Book Center here in Vero Beach, January 12th at 3 p.m. So Brad, you know, I asked you the question. So in, in your, you've often said that your experiences mold your books. How do you walk that line between fact and fiction, secret and, and the immortal MacGyver TV series where they always left out one missing ingredient? Well, it's, it's actually a lot easier than you think. If, it's, if there's something I know that's classified, it's not going in the book, period. Um, but there's enough information out there. For instance, we have special forces that are operating in Syria. We know that. And I know probably more than what most people know about what's going on in Syria. If there's not an official release from the Pentagon saying these men are at this location, then I don't use it. Now, if the Pentagon officially releases that, then it's for public consumption and I can use it. But there's enough information out there on how terrorists operate and what's going on in the world um, that you can weave a pretty good story because I can make the link to my own head about, okay, I saw that story. What's really happening is this. For instance, I, I called... The North Koreans call their uh, chemical munition red mercury. Uh, red mercury is a real thing. Or actually, it's a real myth. It's this um, substance that the terrorists believe is, is like uh, a nuclear bomb. It's a myth- mythological weapon that they firmly believe exists, and they've been trying forever to get it. Uh, they, when I was in Iraq, they, they took all the sewing, singer sewing machines because they were convinced that they were hiding red mercury. It's a big problem in um, Africa right now because people think that there's red mercury and unexploded ordnance, so the kids are trying to get it out, and they're blowing themselves up. Um, it doesn't really exist, but they certainly believe it exists. And so, I, I mean, I knew all that, and so I used that as catnip for the terrorists. They would jump on a chance if North Korea said, we finally developed red mercury, even though they hadn't. The terrorists would say, yeah, we want it. All right, so I always know there's a bunch of different truths in there. That singer sewing machine story you share in this book the daughter of war where things weren't people weren't getting the stuff they needed sewn fashion was behind because people were looking for red mercury in sewing machines was was truth yeah that's true it's a true story <laughs> i mean they go through um various phases of the next next place we're going to find red mercury is this somebody comes up with a rumor and next thing you know everybody's running around trying to find it and it's it's just a myth it doesn't exist it's been debunked over and over again, and somebody's constantly, in fact, I got tweeted when my book came out, um, somebody who's against the, the hoax of Red Mercury because it's killing kids and stuff, tweeted out, uh, Red Mercury doesn't exist, Brad writes fiction, this is a hoax. <laughs> I tweeted him back and said, well, read the book and you'll see I say the same thing. Well, I, I think that they wrote that because so many people know that so much of what you say has an element to truth to it or a truth that is going to come true down the road because you seem to be able to predict what's happening. Yeah, that's and, then, and that's why I encourage them to read the book because I specifically discuss what red mercury is, what the myth is, what they believe, and certainly don't say that North Korea actually invented it. They're just using that name as cabinet. But speaking of current events, the uh, it's it's really hard to write. When you're writing a book about current events, the problem is the events are current. You got to try to stay abreast of what's going on. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote uh, the Insider Threat. And it was about ISIS. Now, I knew a lot about ISIS because I fought them in Iraq. Before they became ISIS, they were Islamic State. Before that, they were Al-Qaeda in Iraq. But um, so they were kind of a nobody group that just entered Syria. They're having a fight with uh, Al-Qaeda, who's in charge, and that kind of stuff. And so I wrote uh, the insider threat. And the next thing you know, they took over the entire country. Took over Mosul, took over half of Syria. And I thought to myself, holy moly, I'm halfway through my book, and we're going to go in there and wipe those guys out, and I don't have a story anymore. Um, We didn't. Uh, and so this time I looked at it and said, what would cause us to leave? It would be a catastrophic event uh, that would cause public opinion to shift and, and tell us to pull out. And I didn't think that would happen, so I designed a catastrophic event in the book. Well, then the next thing you know, the President of the United States says we're pulling out of Syria. I'm like, well, I didn't guess that one correctly. <laughs> um, where do you think we should be going? What's that? Where do you think we should actually be going with all of that, if you're willing to share your opinion? Oh, I think if you can. Well, yeah, there's a lot more risk here than uh, 
we're, we have very good bang for the buck on 2,000 investment, 2,000 soldiers inside Syria. With our Kurdish allies, it keeps Turkey from smacking the Kurds. If we leave there, our influence is gone. It doesn't, it's not so much our kinetic abilities or anything like that. It's American influence. And what Iran wants is a land bridge between Iraq, Iran, into Syria to arm Hezbollah and Lebanon. Now, if we, got, if we leave there, they've got their land bridge. They already have militias in Iraq. We own all of eastern Syria. If we leave eastern Syria, the Kurds are not going to roll over and say, I'm going to die. The Kurds are survivors. They're going to say, okay, the United States left me. Therefore, I need another protector. And who are they going to turn to? They're going to turn to Iran. And the next thing you know, we've lost all the influence there. So, yeah, I think we should stay. It, it, something interesting in what you just said, based on a blog post you just recently wrote, I think it came out in November, you wrote about the assassination of Jamal, and I'm, I'm probably going to slaughter his last name, forgive me everybody out Khashoggi. there, Khashoggi, um, and you wrote a blog, Real Politic, about Jamal Khashoggi, and you talked about Iran, and you talk about, in another post that you'd written about Syria, this whole idea of who do we back, how do we back them, when, when do we really learn about how we keep our moral center and those are a recurring theme inside your books as well your pike logan books and especially i really yeah. see it come out a lot in daughter of war is the whole moral center of the country of an individual that really has to determine every action we take and if we don't keep that we end up paying the price yeah, definitely. There is a lot of that in my book. It is a, the yin and yang. With the security world in and of itself, there's a, um, a, Emmanuel Kant called it categorical imperatives, that there are things you just never do because they're morally bad things. You just don't do them. And then John Stuart Mill's had utilitarianism, which was the outcome of the action determines whether it's moral or not, not the action itself. And that's the yin and yang in, in national security affairs all the time. So like John McCain would say, we will never, ever torture. That's a categorical comparative. We never, ever, ever will torture. Well, then somebody else will say, well, what if he knows what a nuclear bomb is and it's going to blow up New York? Now you've stepped into the greater good. Um, even on the abortion stage, you know, all abortions are bad, all abortions are bad. And the minute you say, unless the mother's life's in danger, now you've stepped into the other side of the coin. And so we see it in national security affairs all the time. And, it's, and I actually do display it in the book quite a bit because it's, I mean, combat is not a uh, black and white world. It is in Hollywood, but it's not in real life. You've got to make decisions. And sometimes those decisions are bad, and when you make those decisions, you have to live with them. You don't wake up the next day and get a do-over. There is no refresh in the video game. So, yeah, I try to capture that in the books. Yeah, and I really think that you, you do. That's I, I've been trying to figure out why your books really resonate for me so well. And, and I think it's because your characters really have to live with the decisions they make and sometimes it weighs on them really really heavily and yeah pike logan especially you know he's got that really dark place inside and something will something triggered him really deeply inside this book and i'm not going to share it except to say that it has to do with a new character you introduce in this book called is it amina or amina 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 and that is what gets me so much is the personal interactions and how much your characters show failings that real people have. They're not superheroes. They're not perfect Hollywood characters. I love James Bond, but they don't walk through unscathed. Right. And and Amina, actually, she's kind of a funny story in herself. She was originally created just as a link for the plot. I had uh, no, no idea she was going to take over the book. The book was actually called Shadow Strike, believe it or not, for the longest time. Okay. And I wrote, I wrote her first scene, I wrote her second scene, and the more I wrote her, the more I liked her spunk, the more I liked her. And um, so she kind of took over the whole book. She became the heart of the book. Uh, and Pike's got to make a choice between her and national security and all these other dilemmas that are going on. Um, but she ended up taking over the book. And the hardest part about writing that was once I reached the point where I, and in my mind's eye where she would exit stage left, and I hadn't even decided how to do that, whether she just ran away or get killed or whatever. I, I decided to keep her in there. Well, then you have to, she has to advance the plot for it. So you can't just be tagging along, you know, the whole book. She's got to do something to advance the plot. So now she's got to have some capability, some skill 
as a 13-year-old girl that Pike does not have. Uh, and so it was, it was a real juggling act trying to get that to work, and I think it works really well now. Oh, it works tremendously. And you kept me guessing throughout the book, is he going to kill her off? Is he not going to kill her off? What's going to happen to her? <laughs> and I can't say any more because I don't want to spoil the book for anybody. Other than to say that she is a refugee from Syria. And the way you you weave in the book this whole idea of really letting us feel what it must be like for a refugee. I'm wondering, did you go to refugee camps in preparation for writing this book? I did not physically step into a refugee camp because they're kind of all barred up. But the ones that are in the book are real. The jungle's a real place in Italy. Uh, a lot of the crossings, I, we've done a lot of research on, you know, the, the flow of migrants, that kind of thing. So the crossing scenarios and all that are real. That's actually how that stuff happens. But I certainly didn't fly to, you know, Erbil and get on a boat with 300 other people and travel across the Med. But that's what they do. You just did a lot of research like you always do and told their story in the way that you yeah. do. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to be back after the national news break. Um, I'm here interviewing today with... Uh, a man I love. I got introduced to him by the Barrow Beach Brook Center. He's here with me today. Brad Taylor on the launch day of his new book, another Pike Logan thriller, Daughter of War. I highly recommend you get it. He's going to be at the Vero Beach Book Center on January 12th at 3 p.m. talking about his book and signing his books. I recommend you get it. And even get it before you get to the book center so you can bring it to him and ask him some questions because this book, leaves me with so many questions, some of which I can't ask on the air today because it would totally spoil it for anybody that hasn't read the book yet. Right, Brad? So (laughs) (laughs) there's a few things, yes. But I'm going to I'm going to ask a whole bunch more questions about some of the things that happen in the book and the research that you did to get it there. And we'll be right back after the national news. Stay tuned, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. If you're just joining us live on iHeartRadio, I'm here today with Brad Taylor, New York Times bestselling author, former um, Army Special Forces, Delta Forces member. His latest book launched today, Daughter of War. It's a new Pike Logan thriller, and I am honored that I get to interview him on a launch day. If you're here in the Vero Beach area or anywhere in Florida um, or can hop on a plane, Come down and meet him in person at the Vero Beach Book Center on January 12th at 3 p.m. So, Brad, we've been having this great conversation about pretty much everything. You've been letting me play with you today, which I love. You let me ask you real-world questions about what's happening in the world, what's happening in politics. And there's an aspect of this book, Daughter of War, that I really want to talk about because you're known for the research that you do. Like you go to the places, your your last book operator down, you went to Lesotho and I mean, you were interrogated for like over eight hours or something like that by these, these men and you might not have gotten out. You know, there was a moment there where you might, nobody might have even known where you ended up, right? And yeah, I was... It was starting to get dark, and I was starting to think, okay, this is getting serious. <laughs> Which is crazy, because you're, you're Special Forces, Delta Force, right? So most of us never think you would allow yourself to get into that kind of situation. But you're not perfect. You're real, right? And you weren't in your Special Forces hat. You were in your Brad Taylor, the author hat, right? <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't very smart. I didn't plan very well. So I did some stupid things, and everything I had on me made me look like I was. I mean, the book, the Operator Down, is about a coup in Lesotho. So everything I had on me was how to do a coup in Lesotho. <laughs> I mean, it's not a, it wasn't very touristy. <laughs> Which, at the same time, should have been the total idea that, why would you be that obvious if you really were planning a coup in Lesotho? Your, your cover right. story, if you really were an author planning on writing a book about that, right? You would think. But, but that's a really good point, right? So many books like you write really seem to set up so much that ends up happening down the road. You're like predictors of the future or are you creating the future? Sci-fi books, especially, we see that all the time, right? These things that actually happen. James Rollins is is famous for these kind of things as well. And and you've been compared to him, but I, I don't think you should be compared to him because you guys are so unique and and so um, amazingly different in your own writing. You 
I think it's an honor to com- be compared to anybody, but um, sure. Your books. I'll take that. (laughs) Okay, cool. Um, So, how do you reconcile this whole idea of what you were writing could come true? I I actually think it's you're not really writing about the future. You're writing about something that's really already happening. But well, really, what it is is there's a lot of things, and most of the things that happen are uh, in the world. They they flash on the screen in the United States, as in we never saw this coming. The truth of the matter is, everybody, if you do enough digging, you can see it coming. The rise of ISIS, you can see it coming. We knew they were talking to al-Qaeda. We knew Zawahiri said al-Qaeda's in charge, and then ISIS took it to al-Qaeda like they took it to everybody else. Uh, we knew they were selling oil to the, to the uh, Syrian regime. We know the Syrian regime's got people inside all those groups because the, the terrorists themselves help out Bashar al-Assad because he wants to frame the whole fight as a counterterrorism fight. I mean, he looks at it and says, hey, it's no different than you going in Afghanistan to get bin Laden. I'm in here trying to get my guys. So it behooves him to let them somewhat exist because um, yeah, it gives him plausible deniability to keep dropping his barrel bombs on his own civilians and saying they're terrorists. Uh, he, you know, he's always blaming the terrorists for the chemical strikes, and we know for a fact it's them. So the, when you start studying that stuff, you can see it and say, where is this going to go? What do you think is going to happen here? And uh, most of the world is more of a slow burn than people realize. It just hits the news one day, and it's like, wow, where'd that come from? Well, I mean, Boko Haram, for instance, I wrote about Boko Haram in Days of Rage, and um, as soon as the book was published, they kidnapped all the girls, and Boko Haram was on the world stage, and people were saying, hey, look, Brad predicted the future. Well, no, I can tell you, Nigeria's known about Boko Haram since 2009. Uh, they, they were lopping off heads for a long time, so it's just not making the American stage. All right, so the signs are there. We may not just be hearing about it because our news cycle isn't talking about it, but it's there if we're willing to do the digging or read the signs is what yeah, I'm hearing. There's, you say. there's always somebody, there's somebody in our intelligence community who definitely knows about it. There's some expert on all that stuff around the world. And okay. they become, you know, the, the guy on the news that goes in front of Congress says, the expert, where'd he come from? Well, he's been studying it for years. Okay. Seeing all that, that small chatter and putting all these tiny pieces together that seem like they're not linked, but then, you realize how they are linked. Yeah, well, this one, and for Dar of War, uh, so I had my premise that North Korea was going to sell some chemical munitions to Bashar al-Assad's regime for him to use against uh, American forces. And I, so I had an overarching plot, but now I had to have, okay, where am I going to set this thing? What am I going to do? And then out of the blue, I get feeds every morning. I spend about two hours every morning just reading feeds from all over the world for all kinds of news stories, and then, you know, hacking and world events and things like that. I got this news story that uh, four North Korean army officers went to a Swiss rifle range and had an accidental discharge. And that's what the news story was. These guys accidentally fired their weapon, and they almost hit one of the Swiss guys. And so it made a news story in Switzerland. I thought, what in the world are North Korean guys doing running around Switzerland? So I started doing research on it. And it turns out there's quite a few North Koreans running around Switzerland because they've got the United Nations there. There's a Geneva security firm there that does, it basically gathers people from all over the world to promote world peace. And Switzerland as a neutral country looks at themselves as the honest brokers. And so their basic contention is, if you don't ever talk to them, you're not going to get anywhere, so we'll be the ones that talk to them. Uh, Kim Jong-un himself went to school in Switzerland. So there's a lot of Swiss, uh, or a lot of North Korean activity running around Switzerland, and that interested me. So then I started doing research on Switzerland, and I came upon all the bunkers, which are really fascinating. So they have... During World War II, they just fortified that place into a giant... There's bunkers all over the place to prevent uh, Germany from running them over. And they're all hidden. They look like... um, Some look like barns. Some look like sheds. They're just all camouflaged in there. Well, then the Cold War happened, and Switzerland made a law that there had to be a fallout shelter for every single Swiss citizen. So then they built a whole bunch... A ton more. Okay, so that part of the book is is true. They really did make this law that every citizen had to have. There had to be a, a fallout bunker for every citizen. Yes, and some of them are enormous. There's one you can actually go into. That's a mini city. Uh, it's and they've done. They did a couple of drills for it, and, and to this day, most people will tell you that it was <laughs> unwieldy. It wouldn't work. There's no way they could get that many people inside that bunker and have a mini city underneath the ground where they didn't all get cholera or something. Right. But yes, everybody had their own position, their own place to go to as a Swiss citizen. Well, then the Cold War ended, and so they've got all these bunkers, 
and so they started repurposing them. Uh, some of them, there's one that's used as a, a, a uh, somebody bought the bunker and uh, makes cheese in there because of the temperatures in the bunkers. Others, one of the big industries that came out was um, cyber stuff. So people said that, uh, you know, the Amazon's cloud is protected by all kinds of cyber attacks, but Swiss built this thing inside a nuclear bunker and said, I'm the only one that can protect you from an electromagnetic pulse attack. I can do both a cyber and a physical destruction. Nobody's going to physically blow up your servers. So if you're working with Amazon, the easiest way to take their server out is not through cyber, it's to slap a bomb on it and blow it up. Right. So they started repurposing all these bunkers for that. And then somebody, they, uh, I think it was 2013, I might be wrong, um, but it's fairly recently, the famous Swiss banking laws, where we're not going to tell you anything about anybody who puts his money in here because we're Switzerland, they finally caved in on that. And so if they're provided a warrant from uh, a reputable country, United States, somebody like that, to check somebody's bank account for tax evasion, they will give them the information. Okay. So the Swiss, Swiss banking laws kind of fell apart. They're no longer secret. Well, somebody got the bright idea. The bunkers are outside the banking law. So now they repurpose the bunkers into giant safes. And so instead of having digits inside currency in a bank account, you now have bricks of gold or artwork inside a bunker. Oh, so it's like and from Harry Potter. <laughs> the banks yeah. in Harry Potter that the... I can't... I'm totally blanking. Where they, everybody stores everything in these... Wow, okay. Well, that's what they do. So there's, they've got these bunkers that have their own private airline or private uh, uh, airport outside of it. They're completely self-contained. Uh, they'll fly you in there. Of course, it's for the super rich people. They'll fly you in there, load all your gold up, load all your artwork up, and then they lock it up in this bunker until they started doing that to get around the Swiss banking laws. And all that was so interesting, I just said, okay, I'm gonna, I'll set this thing in Switzerland somehow. Do, and and they don't about. really care what they're storing in there? So it is possible that what you talk about in this book could be stored? Yeah, because it's, yeah, it's just, they treat it, it's, it's really like a, a safe deposit box. Like when you go do a safe deposit box in the United States, nobody knows what you put in that safe deposit box because that's your private space. Now they've just taken an entire bunker. And you, and you can buy all sizes. You can buy a room size. You can buy the entire bunker. You can buy, or you can do just regular old shelves like a regular bank. So when you go in to put your stuff in, they unlock the bunker for you and say, call us when you're done, and then you're out. Well, talk about what we first started talking about in our, the first segment of the show where we discussed that whole moral imperative that at the end of the day, that integrity, that making sure that you keep that moral center, they're obviously not doing that with this. It's similar to how the Swiss banking let the Nazis take and steal all the artwork and all of the gold and exactly. all these things from the Jewish people. They're just doing the same thing again. Yeah, they, and that's once again, that falls into the, um, the greater good. So Switzerland's saying, as long as I'm um, doing business with uh, um, the Reichstag and with Hitler in Germany, he needs me for my gold, he won't invade me. So the greater good here is I'm keeping Switzerland from falling to Germany. The bad part of that is they start then getting all the gold and the artwork and all that stuff that um, Hitler was looting from the Jewish population. Right. It, it's about them and not about the the whole world, which, you know, that's a, a line that everybody has to walk. So we've got to go into our last commercial break, Brad. We're here with Brad Taylor, already best-selling author of Daughter of War. I'm sure this will soon be another New York Times best-selling book for you, and we'll be right back. Brad, you used to write a couple of books a year. I know you're never sort of not writing a book. This latest book, Daughter of War, you're going to be talking about and signing books at the Vero Beach Book Center on Saturday, January 12th at 3 p.m. Will you be continuing the character Amina that you talk about in this book that you said originally was just sort of supposed to be a character to kind of lace through the book that became such a central character to the book? Because I really need to know. <laughs> yeah, well, as it turns out, um, I, when you, I put everything I have in each book I'm writing, 100%. And then when I'm done, I've boxed myself in because I've created things. For instance, the task force is only allowed to operate certain ways because of that book. Well, now I'm writing a new book. I'm like, boy, I wish I'd never said that because now I need to go another way. Well, I've, I've created Amina. She's there. And so I've got to figure out something. I can't just hand wash it away and say that part of the universe is gone. Um, so, yeah, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do, but she's got to do something. 
So your new book, you're kind of trying to work her in a little bit. Tease me. <laughs> yeah, well, see, I have to right off the bat, because if you've read the last book, you're going to say, okay, what happened here? We're in a reset before Daughter of War. I know all that happened in Daughter of War. What's the answer there? And so I've already got some ideas. I've put some actual uh, words on the page. I'm about 20,000 words in, and uh, they're making some decisions, but I haven't decided which way I'm going to go. Which is a, a common theme for you, because the, the twice that I've interviewed you, you, both times you said you put the characters, you were working one way with them, and then you ended up, the character developed itself in a, in yes. a different way. And I think that's, that's important to, to talk about. Yeah, and I don't plan it, uh, uh, you know, 100% where I sketch everything out. I don't really do outlines. I do what I call a framework where I know the, begins in the beginning and I know the end sometimes. Probably 70% of the time the book ends like I thought it was going to end. Um, but then something happens as you're writing the book and I end up liking something and it starts twisting it going different ways. One of the things I love about your books is you, you use technology in them, but it's not... It doesn't seem to take over the books. It's about the people and their their senses, their their gut feelings about the book. And technology is something that they use. Have you considered doing a book or bringing more cybersecurity or cyber threats into some of your other books? Because you talk, you use the iPhones in here, and you talk about how you can trace them no matter what because you can't take the batteries out, and malware can go on that, and people can still find them and things like that. So you kind of allude to some of it. Has it ever sort of arched as something you want to look at a little bit bigger? Well, some of the, actually, depending on the book, I mean, this is book 13, some of them are very heavy into cyber stuff, some of them are not. Uh, right. It depends on the flow of the story and the plot itself. But one thing you don't want to do is, just, is bore the reader to death with some kind of, you know, intricate technical detail. Now, I'll do... And I've read a few you know, of those. I have 100% of research. <laughs> when I do 100% of research on one technique, 1% will make it in the book. As long as I know that somebody's reading this and knows how that stuff works, will say, yeah, that works then I'm good, but I'm not going to bore the reader to death with how all this is working. But uh, the techniques and all that stuff are certainly there. For, you know, tracking phones is it's called an MZ grabber, and they're all over the place. Uh, the colloquially, they're called a Stingray. The Stingray device is an actual brand name, but it's kind of turned into like Kleenex. When you say, give me a Kleenex, it's not necessarily a Kleenex brand, but everybody knows what you're talking about. Well, these Stingrays are, are becoming a kind of a... a um, personal privacy issue in the United States. They just found a bunch of them in Washington, D.C., and nobody knows who owns them. No federal agency is fast enough to it. So now we're wondering, you know, are these foreign governments placing stingrays all over Washington, D.C. to capture people's phones? So, the, you know, the fact that stingray exists and the fact that that's how they're finding a phone uh, is about all the reader needs to know. I don't need to go into I mean, I do it a little bit because basically how the stingray operates is that the phone is constantly looking for the, the most powerful cell tower. And the Stingray tricks the phone into thinking it is a cell tower. And so it locks on to the Stingray, and now that Stingray owns a phone. Right. So that's about as far as I'll get on the technical side of it. And, and I do love that about you, even though I'm a geek. My, my January 1st show, I had Yuri Diogenes on, and we were talking about cybersecurity and cyber threats. And we talked about, on the air, we can't really go into a lot of deep dive on what people need to know or need to think about when it comes to it. Is cyber cyber threat something that the average person really seriously needs to think about? I don't think the average person, as a, a, a person owning their own personal computer, needs to worry about a cyber threat. Uh, the things that, that everybody needs to worry about, everybody knows about, which is basically identity theft and uh, things like that. Um, that's the, for an individual. Now, as the United States, yeah, we have a lot of vulnerabilities in cyber. And Russia and Iran right now are hacking our power grids trying to get on nuclear facilities, and everything is connected. Uh, the one thing I guess I'd say to the population at large is you have no idea how much stuff in your house is connected to the Internet and how none of it is protected. Now, your computer, you've got your antivirus, and you've got all this, and you're ready to go. Well, Alexa, in fact, I just wrote this in my new book, you can hack Alexa into turning it into a speaker and shipping everything you say in a room out to a, a um, server somewhere. I'm not a speaker, a microphone. So, I mean, there's ways Alexa listens to you say, hey, Alexa, and then it wakes up. Well, you can do a, an Alexa device itself can hear frequencies outside the human ear, and you can make a hey, Alexa command that the human cannot hear, which will wake up the Alexa, 
and then start controlling the device. That's just one example. All those things around the house, TVs, you know, I have a, a, a remote from Xfinity where I talk on the remote and it tells me, you know, put on the Dallas Cowboys football game and it comes on. Well, I have remotes listening to me as I'm carrying the speaker or the remote around. So what, is, what else is getting transmitted to Xfinity that I don't know about? Right. So you're, you're weaving some of that into the latest book that you're working on? Yeah, I just used the Alexa thing to capture a couple of guys, or at least to prove they're bad. Oh, I did um, a lot. I did deep dive on it and said, that, you know, that there's um, like your refrigerator and your washing machine. Those all talk to the Internet now. Right. And nobody ever thinks about it. But to penetrate your Wi-Fi system while you've got all these great passwords and all this stuff set up for your computer that talks to the Internet, if somebody can hack your washing machine, they can get on your Wi-Fi. So those kind of things are all over the house. Yeah. I've actually, last year, I had a number of people on talking about that. And people are like, what do you mean? That's not real. That's not real. And it's it's so great hearing it from you as well that, yeah, this is real. You need to be thinking about it and to know that you're weaving it into your new book. I hope that stays in there and you don't pull that out. <laughs> no, it's definitely in there. I, I had to figure out a way to penetrate a hotel room that's got a lock that I could not figure out how to penetrate. So I said, I mean, it's a real hotel inside Charleston and um, did the research on the hotel. They had a Lexa device, and so I said, let me do some research on that. Turns out you can hack that thing, so that's what I did. Oh, man, I can't wait. wonder what the hotel's going to think when the book comes out. Go, we have to figure out how to make better security at our hotel now. Yeah, well, it's pretty easy to Google. There's some patches out there. The one I use, there's several different techniques. The one I use, the Alexa device talks to every other Alexa device on your specific network. Um well, what's the specific network to a hotel? It's the Wi-Fi everybody in the hotel uses. So if right. you're in a room five doors down, that Alexa is going to talk to every other Alexa in the hotel. Right. Now you need to pinpoint the Alexa you want to hack, and there you go. <laughs> it actually, we make it so easy, don't we? Yeah. All right, well, um, we're coming towards the end of the show. You're going to be here in Vero Beach at the Book Center on January 12th at 3 p.m., and... You're going to be signing your books and you're going to be talking. I'm really excited about that. Today is launch day for Daughter of War, your book, um, another Pike Logan thriller. Last thought you'd like to share with my listeners? I just hope to see you at Vero Beach. I'm looking forward to it. And if they can't see you in Vero Beach, you're on a tour right now, right? Where else are you heading? I am. Uh, let me look at my schedule. I'm in Phoenix right today. I do two signings here in Phoenix. Then I go to Houston. I do a signing in Houston. Then I go to Dallas, do a signing in Dallas. Then I head to Oklahoma. And then I head to uh, Vero Beach. And that's... Yeah, you can go to my website at bradtaylorbooks.com. The whole schedule's posted there. Oh, and that's also a great place, everybody. If you think you've missed one of Brad's books or you're... You see a, a, a Pike Logan book and you're not sure which order it's in, uh, Brad has them all up on bradtaylorbooks.com. You can see the order of the Pike Logan books. I, I found and that very useful. Excerpts. There's also excerpts from uh, every book. If they want to read an excerpt, there's at least one excerpt for each book in there. Yeah, that's the reason that books and orders in there is because I kept getting yelled at by readers, so I've made it. <laughs> yeah, because some people, you find them later before you know they didn't catch them at the beginning when the books came out and i highly recommend everybody i love brad's blog and he posts them up there and we were talking before the show that he doesn't have all his blog stuff up because some of his blogs end up as op-eds in some top newspapers and stuff because he pulls no punches politically (laughs) in his op-eds so if you want to have an eye on to like the real world from a, a fresh what I call moral integrity perspective of, look, look, these are the facts. This is really what's happening. You want to look at, at Brad's blog as well. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I like to read stuff. You know what I think you need to put up there? Here are the news feeds that you read, you know, in that two hours. Because I would love to know what you're reading. I have it. I used to actually have a thing called link analysis that had a bunch of links on there. And uh, the problem with it is, is I, I do have a ton of news feeds every day. Well, sometimes the news feeds change, the links change, I get a new news feed, uh, and then it was just impossible to keep that thing updated. People get frustrated because they click on a link and it's a dead gotcha. link now okay. they've updated. All right, well, if you get a chance, email me with some of them or because or <laughs> I'd okay. really love to know. But I want to thank you so much for being here, and um, I'm hoping to get over to the Book Center on Saturday at 3 p.m., on the 12th to see you and if those who are listening internationally because it is listen uh, shows listened to in over 21 countries on podcast 
grab a copy of Daughter of War, and maybe you can convince Brad to come to your country and do a book signing. So thanks for being on the show, Brad. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Have a great day, everybody. And remember, the right questions can change your life. So what are you asking today? You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today. 